Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Blankenberg, and welcome to Alexa and Friends. We are here today, uh, as always, to talk with somebody interesting from the world of voice and Alexa. And today I have the good pleasure of joining Manoj Sinwani, uh, and he is here as the Vice President of Alexa Speech AI. Thank you so much for being here today. Good morning, Jeff. Glad yeah, to be here. thank you. So um, I, I know that I pre-warned you about this. I don't normally warn my guests about this, but I have a couple of we'll call them nonsensical questions uh, that I like to ask all of my guests. And so I thought I'd just start with that. It kind of loosens things up a little bit. It lets people get to know you a little. Um, and so we'll, we'll roll right into those. Um, the first one I have for you is if you could choose any superpower that you've ever heard of, which one would you pick? Now, a lot of people will say things like, oh, I would want to be Superman. Well, Superman has a lot of powers. You only get to pick one superpower. What would that one be? I think the superpower I would like to have is to have an amazing memory. So if I read a science paper, I can recall it at any oh, time. Wow. Or if I read anything else, so that I have all the information on my fingertips. I frequently find that, oh, I read it. What was it about? And, you know, you always have those moments. I would just would like to have that memory, which is just Super, super amazing. memory. All right. I, I can get behind that. I could. My wife would agree. I definitely need that. Um, so I'm curious though, do you have mechanisms that you use in your life to enhance your memory? Are there, are there tools or software or just like procedures that you go through to try to remember things better? No, I don't. I just let it go. <laughs> and uh, I'm not embarrassed when I tell people, I, I just can't recall. I know it's on the tip of my tongue. Right. And it's okay. No, that's, I agree. It's totally fine. I'm, I'm of the belief we're, we're in an age now where it's okay not to know things because most of it you can go find, you can go look it up. You can revisit the thing. Um, when, when I was a kid and I imagine this is the same for you, like it was much, much harder because I didn't have a computer in my pocket that I could just look up all the answers. Uh, I, I joke with my friends that it used to be, we would just have to say, well, I guess we'll agree to disagree. And now, now it's yeah. no, 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 I need to prove to you that you're wrong and I'm going to show you, uh, on my phone. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, uh, when we are having a dining table conversation, you know, normally you have this rules, no cell phones. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Now I have Alexa. So I can just ask Alexa. <laughs> we have a debate going on on who acted in a certain movie Perfect. or how old they are. And uh, yeah, the information is at the fingertip or at least it's accessible right. without even getting Right at up. the tongue tip. It's at the tongue tip available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's great. Okay, so this other one's a little crazier, um, but I need to know not only what your answer is, but why you pick that one. It's just two choices. Um, so you are in a situation where you either have to fight a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? I would just fight one, because I think that with one, I have a better shot. One, if there one, are one people, giant duck. It's okay. If I die, I die. If I lose, I lose. But trying to fight 100 people who can surround me from all angles and just, just go at it, I, I don't know. I think my I'll take my chances with one, with one big one. I may be out able to outrun. I may be able to outsmart. Yeah. There's no way I'm outsmarting hunters. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of small biting horses. I'm I'm in the I'm on the fight one thing camp as well. I think. Um, but that that's always a fun angle. A lot of people have a different answer, so it's it's always interesting For to sure. see how people take on that one. All right. So so you've been with Alexa since kind of the early days. You've been around for quite a while. Uh, and one of the things that I really like to do when we do these kinds of interviews is get a feeling for where you came from. Like, how, how did you land here? Because I would imagine most people, when they got out of college, university, they didn't think, hey, I want to be the, voice, the vice president of speech AI at, at Amazon. That didn't exist, right? So how, how did you get here? What was your path? What would it look like? It's actually very interesting. I, I'll go back a little, because as you can tell, I've been in the industry long enough. Uh, on how my journey was, and there was no way I could have seen it ending at Alexa. But it's amazing when you start connecting the parts, you go, yeah, it was actually meant to end here. So uh, I started my career in real-time systems. Those were the days where, you know, the responses had, had to be given in microseconds. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what happens when you have Alexa everywhere. Right, I had um, to run around and meet all of mine, too. <laughs> yeah, I should have done that, too. So uh, I started in real-time embedded systems, you know, process control for power plants. 
And soon I moved into networking because guess what? Networking is based on real-time operating systems. And that's where I started working on this new class of products where you are trying to integrate voice and data all on one product as opposed to having separate products for data, separate product for telephony. And I worked on that for about three, four years, uh, working even on cell phones. Uh, those were the early days where cell phones only did voice. Uh, and from there on, um, I, I actually got into this company that was working on voice over IP, which was kind of relatively unknown at that time. They were one of the pioneers. Uh, and the reason I got into voice over IP was because I had worked on this voice and data integration and whatnot. And that was my first foray into the whole world of signal processing. Because in the world of voice over IP, you really have two distinct components. One is this protocol that's let you, let you set up the phone call uh, through all the parameter negotiation and whatnot, and that's the experience I came with. But the other part is to really, how do you take this analog signal and transmit it over uh, an IP network? So you got into uh, line echo cancellation, acoustic echo cancellation, compressing the voice, decompressing the voice, which is fascinating for me yeah. on, on how you just take all of this and take out a network that was meant uh, and designed for a very different way of sending voice, and you replace it with IP-based network. And I was there for about 10 years working on many different kind of products. Uh, and uh, you know, most of the voice over IP products uh, that are in the industry today, we had you know, a pretty big mind share of at that point. Uh, and from there on, I actually started working on, while I was at that company, started working on cable modems. Mm. Cable companies wanted to offer voice services and they had to use voice over IP. So I, I actually got involved into integrating voice over IP onto this cable modem that were in your house. And now you're worried about people have existing telephone lines, existing sockets. How are you going to offer them voice over IP? But it feels like old telephony. So we did that, uh, you know, and as you know, cable companies got involved in uh, telephony big time and they still are. As I was working on that, uh, this one person just called me out of the blue and said, hey, I would love to have beer with you. Like, why are you having beer with me? <laughs> uh, but he said, you know, beer will be good. Why don't you just give me you know, a few hours of your time? I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll have beer. So I went there to meet with him, and they had this great idea of taking an existing telephony that had not changed for a long time, where you pick up, you've got a dial tone, which is an indication to you that the service is live, and then you start punching digits, and it sets up a call, and then you go, hello, and you start talking. They felt that time had come to really take that telephony to the next level. And they were thinking that the cable companies need to make, to differentiate their telephony service from the old Marvel so that people can start taking the service. And their idea was, what if there's no dial tone? You pick up the phone and a voice comes up and says, hello, what would you like to do? Now you start thinking, well, well it sounds a little bit like Alexa, it does. doesn't it? And, and so what we tried to build then was to say that this is the, there's a cable modem in the house that was designed to be very low cost desi uh, device to offer data and voice access. How do I make it voice enabled? I can't just go to the cloud because it is designed to run voice over IP on the device itself. So we came up with this great idea of creating a cloud-based system and a very, very small, think of as a voice browser, oh. that I can render pages, but they sound like voice. So when you pick up, there's a, there's a, there's a landing page or home page, and it starts by saying, Xtone, what would you like to do? And you go and say, call mom. It could actually render the next page and, and said, so do you want mom's mobile or home? And set up the call. And so we, had, we got into this architecture that was very cloud-based, small browser on the device. And, and that's where I got into the whole speech recognition and text-to-speech and how do you give, how do you create these dialogues, what we call voice user interface, right. which is similar to GUI, but on the voice side. And I had no idea somebody's going to work on Alexa or Alexa type of product will be created in the future. That company did not do well, even though we had a working product and uh, and it, it was functional, uh, and we felt it was a great product. It had actually a lot of things. We were, you could have tweet, you could uh, get status from your Facebook page, you could order pizza, and it knew that if you I said call mom, it'll call my mom. It, if my wife said call mom, it'll call her mom. So uh, we had built a lot of good stuff. Uh, but anyway, that company did not do well. 
And then this company from New York called me up and said, hey, we're working on smart home. We need somebody like you who has experience on the cloud side and the device side. Next thing you know, I'm working for this company. And their intent was to create this smart devices in the house that you can control from anywhere in the world and have a dashboard. It also tells you how much energy is being consumed by your PC, by your power sockets, by your water heater. So you have this like a monthly view on where is your energy going? Where is your energy, all the money you're spending on electricity, where is it going? And I was there for a year, uh, created the platform, launched it. And from then on, I moved into uh, uh, a company that was working on smart grid. So as you know that there's an automation going on in electric networks and it's the world of IoT now. Their intent was take a sensor, just plug it on a, on a medium uh, voltage wire and it can power itself through induction and it look for faults. So what we call bird on wire. So you will see those these power lines by the side of the road. Sometimes you will see a sensor on those wires. It's actually, that's an IoT device that I worked on oh. and it could detect if there's a ground fault because in a ground fault, a large amount of current will flow very quickly. And, and based on that, we came up with this whole idea that you can even look at waveforms and predict certain faults from ha and no knowing that certain faults are about to happen. Wow, that's pretty cool. So now you start thinking about cloud, speech, <laughs> signal processing, smart home. And then this company called me up, uh, which the company I admired for a long time, but they won't tell me what product it was <laughs> that I would work on. Yeah. The only time I ever joined a company without knowing what I would work on is Alexa. And it's one of the smartest decisions I made. And I still sometimes look back and say, what made me make that decision? Right. Just live very little information. They could not even tell me it's speech-based product. So it's a cool product, you will love it. And, you and there's something about the people I met, I was like, yeah. It's worth taking a risk at that point, and it turned out great. Uh, I, yeah, I would say so. That's a, that's an amazing story, and I think, uh, I, I know for me personally, but probably for a lot of the people that are watching too, um, you had a career path that I think most of us would love to have had, right? You got to dabble in smart home. You got to dabble in voice. Uh, you got to build all sorts of innovative technology. That's, uh, that's quite a story. Thank you for sharing that. So, But I will tell you, none of that I... I was looking for, oh, I need to work on smart grid. Oh, I need to work right. on smart home. It was the opportunity right. came, and out of many opportunities, that's the one that appealed to me. I like it. No, it's just a, it's a good series of choices that you made. I think it's great. Uh, all right, so now, so now you're at Amazon, and you're working on this secret thing, Alexa. Um, and ha, how early on were you in the pro in the project? Were I joined. Uh, I I joined six months before it was launched. So a lot of pieces were okay. there. And we were getting into putting the you know the final touches, the polish, and getting the accuracy sure. higher. So it was a good time in that there was a lot of pressure to launch, yeah. and there were a lot of challenging things. You know, it's, it's people always say the first eighty percent are easier. Now, I, I grant that people who worked on it had to do a lot of innovation, very original thinking. But I got into the last twenty percent where you're trying to really get to improving the accuracy, where it's getting harder and harder. So it was one of those fun times. I joined, I think, at a, at a decent yeah. time. I wish I'd a year of earlier, course. but... Uh, I, I do too. It. I came in about nine months after the product launched, and um, I really wish I had been there prior. But it's, man, it's, I mean, I'm still here f almost four years later. I love it. So it, that's that's awesome. Uh, all right, so, so you are the vice president of Alexa Speech AI, uh, and that means that you and your group are responsible for certain aspects of what Alexa does. So what are the things you are responsible for? What are the things that maybe aren't part of your, your scope? So part of my, my uh, title gives it away, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit more color. So we think of ourselves as a team that processes all speech. And when we think of processing speech, we think of speech that is coming to us and speech that is coming going from us to the user. So that's your voice of Alexa. When you hear that pleasant voice, uh, that we consider that uh, part of our role because it is very much related to speech processing. So you think about Alexa when you uh, when you start saying when you when, when you want to speak to Alexa, you will start with a wake word. We'll say Alexa, do something. Uh, so we start with a wake word. Uh, so on the device, uh, we look for a wake word. That's an indication to us that the user to us. Uh, so my team uh, works on the wake word. 
Once we detect that wake word has been spoken, meaning that intend to speak to Alexa, then we will start processing your speech. And that's what we call speech recognition. So we're looking for what are the words you have spoken? Uh, we do not know what those words mean, but what are the words that, that are being spoken? We take incoming audio and we'll convert it into a text output. Uh, and that is a representation of what the person said. And then we give it to downstream services, for example, like language understanding. That's not something that's something that my team doesn't do. Uh, so we we are the first point where you get into Alexa in some ways. Um, now, in addition to that, there are many other places where we handle speech. So one is what we call text to speech. This is where you take an incoming text. For example, uh, you ask for music, and we we're saying playing artist X from from Amazon Music. So. Uh, uh, so that's the text to speech. We take an incoming text and we convert it into a very natural sounding speech on the fly. These are not pre canned speech, it's just generated. Uh, the other part of uh, speech is what we call uh, uh, speaker ID. It's identifying who's the person speaking in the house. So when you have multiple people in the house, we can personalize knowing which person at given point was speaking. And we call it speaker ID. We're identifying who the speaker is amongst the household members. Uh, and, and then another piece that my team works on is what we call local voice control. So we started thinking about, we started with an architecture that was most of the stuff runs on the cloud, but there are cases, there are times when cloud is not accessible, especially as, as you start thinking about on the go. I'm walking on the street and you know the cell phone network can be very congested. You may have weak signal, you may have a strong signal and still not have an internet access. Uh, so we started thinking there are scenarios where what the user is trying to do doesn't really need cloud. Uh, uh, so local voice control is an, is, is an ability to run some of the um, capabilities that Alexa has, even when you don't have a broadband. And a lot of that involves speech processing as well. And then the final piece, it's what we call acoustic alerts. So this is something we launched last year as part of Alexa Guard. Acoustic alerts, it's saying that I can detect certain things based on what I hear and a user may have a strong interest in knowing when that happens. So for example, if a smoke detector in your house started beeping, you're not in the house. It could be an indication of a problem, serious problem in the house. It could be an indication of some issue with the smoke detector itself. But if, you are on the, if you're not in the house, you would want to know that a smoke detector went off in your house. And we can do that because uh, we can separate that sound from other ambient sounds in the house. And again, that's not really speech processing per se, but it's processing a lot of audio that's in the house. So those are the components that my team works on. Very cool. All right, so so let's get into a couple of those. Um, the first one that I really wanted to talk about was wake word, and a, a lot of you know how that stuff works. So I know that that's something that we're still actively researching and working on is the whole concept behind the the wake word and its engine. So. What are some of the challenges you guys are facing or addressing as you go through that process? Yeah, so as you know, we are a far field device. You can speak to device from you know, 20 feet away. Uh, think about if you're in a crowded place or there's a lot of noise and somebody calls your name, you may not always know that somebody's calling your name. So we have to deal with a lot of these uh, background conditions uh, that happen uh, when you are speaking from a distance. There could be a background speech. You could have an appliance running. Appliance could come on right in the middle of you saying certain things, uh, and you could place a device very close to the wall. There's gonna be a lot of reflections that come from the wall. And we have to be extremely accurate. Uh, we, we want to detect every single time you want to speak to the device, and we do not want to detect any other time. So the, the, the accuracy bar is extremely high, regardless of what's going on in the background. There may be people speaking in the background. right? You know, and that's what happens in the house, right? So think about I'm in a dining table, there's a conversation going on, we have a big debate going on, and I go and say, Alexa, how old is person X? People in my in our constant conversation didn't stop, and I'm speaking from a distance, I'm on the side of the device. It has to detect that every single time. And and that's hard. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's what makes it so much fun. And you know, when we started, working on this device. A lot of people thought that, you know, those things are lab experiments, they won't work in real life. And we actually have shown it, it, it works, it works really well. And you have to do it in all sorts of devices. 
And in every condition, think about this. We have an Echo Auto device. It's in my car. Can I have one too? Every car makes a very different noise. It makes a noise on, and the, there is a road noise. And depending on what type of road it is, you may have a window open. You may have a window slightly open. You may have a vent going on uh, because it was hot and the AC just kicked in. Uh, uh, think about all the noises that are in the, that you hear in the car. Mm -hmm. You want to just go and say, Alexa, call Amy. It has to work. It has to work flawlessly, even in that situation. Yeah. Echo Bird, walk, you're walking on the street. You're exercising. You want to just change the music. Uh, so the, all of these conditions are extremely hard, and but we want and we have a very high accuracy bar. So I, I've spent some time thinking about and, this. And and I, I have. One more thing. I yeah, have devices all over my house and uh, you know, they like some are in corners of kitchens and stuff. And I've noticed that like when you have a lot of wall bounce, it seems to you know, affect the, the, the way that it responds. Um, but I'd never given any thought to what it must be like to be on your side and have to test all of this stuff. So I don't imagine that you have every model of car with every type of window uh, open so that you can test all those things. Do you guys just, introduce sounds as you test these things or do you have like a a lab that can produce that kind of interference you're looking for how does how does that stuff work both both we do have we do have labs where we can test uh, but you know real life conditions are and there are a lot more variations to yeah. it uh, we also have created a lot of test sets and these test sets have um, you know audio with a lot of background noise and we can we can create more by injecting noise of different kind so that's the first level the second level is then you go in, you also go in the lab and you test. And the third is, uh, you know, um, you can test with a smaller set of users as you are making incremental changes. And if those changes are working so much better, then you can you can deploy that uh, to a larger customer. Got it. Very, very cool. Um, so one of the other challenges that I always think about that must be daunting is that, you know, we're in the billions of utterances a month. Um, what what are the challenge like? That's a massive scale to try to handle. How how do you guys go about that? What are the challenges that come from that? And specifically for the wakeboard? Yeah. Okay. So, interesting thing is that wakeboard is detected on the device itself. All the processing of the wakeboard happens on the device. Billions of instructions coming to you know millions of devices, but they're all happening on the device. The scaling is not that hard if you just think from that perspective, which is. I want to be able to detect wakeboard on any any Alexa device in the house. Then we do what we call second stage cloud side verification because we have a very very high accuracy bar, and we know that devices have constraints in terms of MIPS and memory that you can put on it. So when a device says that hey I think Alexa was spoken, we then run a second model in the cloud that says hey with a bigger model, bigger memory, bigger MIPS, is it still a wake up? Is it a genuine wake up where somebody was asking us uh, to do certain thing. Now that has to process uh, every single address that passed through uh, device detecting that Alexa was spoken. And, and clearly that has to handle a lot, ton and ton of uh, uh, instructions coming in. But we have become very good at scaling. There's one interesting problem in all of that that you may not think about is this. Think about when we put an Alexa ad during Super Bowl. How many devices are within an earshot of a TV? Yeah, I, I've thought about this too. This is uh, this is interesting. So how, how do you guys think that about is, that? That is a scaling problem because if all of those devices wake up, first of all, they should not wake up because it is coming from a TV. And if we are unable to detect that it came from a TV versus a person, it's not that much different. If I put you in a room and don't tell you where the sound is coming from, a lot of times you would not know it came from a TV. So it's, the TVs have become really good. The sound quality from TV, TV is amazingly yeah. good. So how do you handle these situations where you know, and sometimes you know, because you know that we place an ad, it's going to come in third quarter, you know, and uh, fine. But there are comedians who will talk about Alexa. You know, Jimmy Fallon has this uh, this bit where you have to make Alexa say certain words. You know, there's a lot of TVs that are playing that show at any given point of time. So we had to invent. Those were some of the things that, uh, you know, as we got uh, after launch, we started uh, getting into the situation, we're like, uh oh, how do you handle this? Super Bowl is watched by a lot of people, <laughs> yes. and we have other devices out yeah. there, and that is really a challenging problem. And we had to come up with many new technologies to be able to handle those things. Oh, that's so cool! Um, all right, one more thing, uh, and, and let's talk a little bit. You mentioned Alexa Guard earlier, 
where uh, it can detect things like smoke detectors or breaking glass. So um, a surface like that has to be um, a, a, like th being able to identify those sounds, but also being able to ignore things like a dog barking. Um, what, what, what kind of things did you encounter in going through that process? Yeah, you know, the, a lot of that is machine uh, learned models. So you have to have the right amount of data. If you do have a right amount of data, you can create models that are able to separate them. The challenge comes, how do you get the data and how are you able to get data? Well, ambient sound in my house from your house is different. Uh, between urban and suburban is very different. Between apartment buildings and townhouses and single family homes, the noise profiles are extremely different. And then you have cars driving by and a delivery person coming in, knocking on the door, and all kind of stuff. It's extremely challenging on how you how do you get how do you get the right amount of data. Plus, more important is even some of the applications. So we actually have uh, what we call glass break detection. So if somebody broke your window to come into your house, we want to be able to detect it and send you an alert saying, we think somebody broke into your house. You may want to uh, check check that out. Now think about how do you collect sound for glass break? And there are all kinds of glass material used in many different kinds of windows. And the glass material used in one country is different from others. Right. And where Alexa is placed in terms of where the window is, it changes quite a bit. Where to get very creative it's not like I can go and you know give guns to people or stones and say go and break the glass and let me let me record the sound. Right. Uh, yeah, you know we had to get very very creative wow. and I can tell you the glass break sound on the movies is not real. <laughs> if I train my model on that, it won't detect it. It'll only detect if you're playing a movie. Oh wow, that's that's uh, both good and bad. I guess it makes it easier for you to tell that their house isn't being broken into just because they're watching Home Alone. But uh, that's oh that's that's super cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to pivot a little bit. We're going to move on to the second thing that you talked about, which was uh, kind of uh, voice recognition, speaker ID stuff. Um, so as, as we think about that, like, can you tell me about how that works or, or how, you, how you think about that process? Yeah, so there, there are two steps in speaker ID. One is what we call enrollment, and the second one is uh, being able to detect uh, when somebody is using the device. So we need to know how your voice sounds to be able to detect, you know, who is speaking. Just like, you know, if I meet somebody for the first time uh, and even if I walk away and next time they call me, I would not know it is them. Sure. It, it takes time for us to learn. Uh, everybody's voice is, is different, the way we say certain words. So we go through this enrollment process. And in the enrollment process, we will ask the user to speak four sentences with certain words. And those words give us a very good coverage. Uh, and using those... We, we create what we call voice profile. It's basically a capture of certain uniqueness about your voice, if you think on those sure. terms. So now when you're speaking, so let's say that you, both you and your wife are enrolled. Now we have two voice profiles. And anytime a user is interacting while we are going through speech recognition, we also start to see, is this voice matching one of the profiles I know? If it matches one of the profile, then we can say with certain uh, confidence, that hey, is Jeff speaking, or it's a person I do not know, could be a guest in the house. Uh, or, and, and so we use that information then, and based on that, Alexa can personalize some of the experiences. For example, if you listen to a certain kind of music, uh, and if you just say, Alexa, play me some music, and if we know it's Jeff who's speaking, then we can play music that you like. Uh, but a lot of that really comes from learning how Jeff speaks, and then being able to match very, very fast as you're speaking, there was Jeff who was speaking. And think about some of the phrases are very short. Yeah. No, it's, and this is something that I actually use quite a bit. This is why I wanted to ask you about that, is because every morning, you know, I walk in the bathroom, I get ready, shower, all that stuff, and I have a, an echo in my office, or in my bathroom, I'm sorry. And um, I can just say, play my music. And it plays my playlist from my Apple Music, and everything works really, really well. But you, you said something interesting there that I, I want to dive into a little bit, which is that um, it, it can't recognize obviously people that haven't been in my house before that haven't been enrolled with my device. Um, but I, I, I think I can, right. I can go to my friend's house and get it to recognize me. Um, right. You can kind of, uh, what is the, the word I'm looking for? Um, you can kind of disconnect or connect yourself to your friend's devices when you're at their places. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, this is actually, this is a very, uh, 
It's a very interesting application that we launched, uh, I think about a year ago, and uh, it's super cool. So the way it really works, it's we know how you sound, because if you have enrolled, we know how Jeff sounds. But we only try to recognize between members of the household. So when you go to your friend's house and you say, Alexa, connect my device, um, we will take, uh, based on, you know, we will know who you are based on certain information. We'll ask you for your phone number. And based on the phone number, we know that Jeff is the one who wants to uh, get added to that device from uh, for temporary uh, interval. And then we will take your profile and activate it on that device. So now when you are speaking or other people who are enrolled in that household are speaking, we'll try to distinguish between those people who are speaking. So you go to your friend's house and say, hey, play my favorite playlist after you have connected to that device. It's not playing a playlist. It's pretty cool that you can be at your friend's house and say, hey, I, created, I have this great playlist uh, that I created on Spotify or Amazon Music and let me play it for you. And, and then when you leave, you can just disconnect. And if you don't disconnect explicitly, then it'll disconnect after, I think, 24 hours oh, or so. Interesting. So th there's a science problem behind this, I would imagine, which is differentiating all of the voices. And um, I I'm just curious, uh, this is more like a, do we ever think this is possible? I, I know this isn't, po isn't something we do today. But is there ever a situation where I could walk into a Home Depot or some big box store and say, where are the hammers? And it's like, oh, Jeff, the hammers are down here. Right, like I yeah, I think yeah, I think that the the way you think about that because there's also security aspect and privacy aspect and and all of that. It's really what we you know just like you do two factor authentication, for example. You could think about those cases where you walk in uh, and based on some other information uh, and the vicinity of where you are, uh, you don't need to explicitly connect. And yeah, so so that but that you know is something you think is possible. You have a situation where, you are not there and somebody's thinking, oh, Jeff was in Home Depot. Right. That would be pretty yeah, bad. Yeah, I agree. So that's why you want to do with the multi-factor okay. uh, authentication. And your voice is one of them. But it could be facial recognition or phones or Bluetooth or a number of other factors. Got it. Num number of okay. other things. And then when you speak, so even if you, you know, um, have multiple members who are in a household, when you speak, we want to recognize it was Jeff who was speaking. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. All right. So... Uh, the, the next topic that I wanted to get into is uh, one that's close to me because as someone that spends a bulk of my time building stuff for Alexa and for um, obviously for voice interactions, um, automatic speech recognition is something that is really, really valuable to that process. So I know when, when the Echo came out, um, a lot of people kind of thought like, well, voice, that's something I already have, right? I have it on my phone with Siri or something like that. Um, and I think it's often viewed as like a solved problem. Is that is that true? <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> I, I would say this. I think that that sentiment was normally held by, not by speech scientists. Uh, people who are in the field never felt that way. Uh, because we know the challenges and we know that, you know, um, we have an ability to solve problems and improve things. Uh, if you really think about the old use cases, they were very limited use cases, and that limited use cases, it kind of worked. And people have certain expectation, yeah, well, there's speech recognition, how good it, can it be? It's when you start showing something that's far better, you go, uh-oh. You know, I, for example, when I go into my car, it frustrates me, when I, if, because the recognition there is extremely poor, even on a very narrow search space, which is just call somebody, right. you know? How many people are in my contacts now? Five to 50, maybe? Um, so if you really think about when we were trying to launch Echo, uh, we wanted to do far field. For us, it was extremely important. We felt that is a compelling and very, very good customer interface. It was not a solved problem at that time. It was not even, you know, people thought, well, yeah, just, you know, yeah in, in, you know, in research, uh, yeah, we can show, but it, it, will never, it can never be productized. Sure. And, and now it's given, yeah, far field speech works. And the other thing you have to think about is it has to be extremely fast. Um, yeah, you know, and and uh, if you go back to the old speech recognition system, they were not this fast. Um, uh, so we had to solve for a latency problem. And then latency when when the, the vocabulary size is big, think about music, how big are music catalogs? Right. Uh, you know, they're huge and they're always changing. Every week <laughs> new songs come out, every day songs come out, new artists come out. New songs get very popular. 
And then artists, you know, they have they are artists. They have some really good names like Kesha with dollar in it. Right. Yeah, I was I was actually okay. going to use that as an example of how you handle that situation. Right. Yeah. So if you know, so those are the things that you have to solve in speech recognition. We want it to be very very good, even when we're dealing with things that require very large catalogs, ever changing catalog. Think about question and answers. You can ask Alexa anything. Look at how big a space, search space, and how big a vocabulary we have to to be able to do, and we still want to do it much, much faster than what had been done in the past. Yeah, my goodness. And now you think about a device with a really, really good speaker, where even Alexa may be spoken by that speaker. So we had to deal with echo cancellations that are very, very good, because the microphones are going to pick up. These are really good microphones, and there are many of them on the device. They're picking up sound from 360 degrees, including sound coming from the, the device itself. So there are a bunch of challenges um, so this, I, I, I would say it's still not a solved thing. That we're always improving. So, uh, I would imagine for being able to do speech recognition that there's there's got to be individual components that kind of make that up. That like there there are stages that it works through. Um, this is not anything I know about, but I'd love for you to enlighten me on kind of what those are and how like how does that work? What's the what's the process? So I, I'll I'll give you what what. Most of the speech recognition systems have what are the different components, and then you can start seeing how it how it all connects. So the first is what we call acoustic modeling, acoustic model, acoustic model, uh, and what it does it's it takes all the incoming audio, uh, and it is sent in a small package from the device, and it tries to uh, detect uh, what we call phonemes or the sounds from their audio and it'll create a phonetic representation. And that's basically taking the audio and creating this representation of the sounds that are being heard. Next piece is lexicon. And the, the intent there is to say, okay, based on the sounds, what is the word that is being spoken? So it takes into this small uh, sound representations or phonemes, um, could even be subphoneme, and, and, and from there try to figure out what is the word being spoken. And then once you have those words, then the last one, the third piece is what is called language model. And the language model is trying to really figure out because you have you have many, many possibilities on what word was being spoken. A lot of words that sound pretty similar to each other. What it tries to do is to say, okay, if based on the previous few words, what word is it likely to be? So it's trying to abjugate between you know various possibilities uh, by really looking at what are the previous words or what are the previous two words, what we call n-gram basically looking at n words in a sequence. And from there trying to say, I think the, the likelihood of this, this is the word being spoken, is much, much higher than the other word. Gotcha. So those are the three pieces you will normally see in the system, acoustic models, lexicon, and then language models. Very interesting. So that seems to be almost the reverse of what I would do to produce speech out of Alexa, right? I take um, words and I have to produce them back to Alexa, but oftentimes I find that she may not pronounce a word the way I expect her to, or um, my last name used to be a big issue. Blankenberg was something uh, that was stumbled over. And so um, I started using phonemes as a way to produce the speech the way that I wanted it to be represented. Uh, and in my head, that's always how it worked, is that you mapped it back the other way, and it sounds like that is actually the case. So that's that's cool. I feel smart today. <laughs> uh, all right, well, thank you. Um, so one of the other things that I tend to play with quite a bit is whisper mode. Um, and the idea that Alexa can whisper to me, but not only that, but recognize that I whispered to the device, um, there's gotta be some, some magic happening there to make all that happen. Can you tell me about whisper mode? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting when this, how the whisper mode came about. I think it's one of the cool features and I, it, uh, I'm very, very proud of, uh, uh, having a you know role in in launching that capability, so we were we had our text to speech systems, and and our TTS team came up with this uh, cool technology where they could take an existing voice and create a whispered voice through a signal processing wow. techniques. Yeah, the voice will sound like hey, you know it's the same my voice. Yeah, and they they were play, they were they were trying different things and they said, oh, this is cool. We have whispered voice. And one of the executive uh, 
in Alexa was trying to set an alarm and uh, didn't, you know, and they, they forgot what the volume level was and they spoke to the device and the device spoke and, and, and speak a little louder. And he said, wouldn't it be cool if it actually could know that I don't want, you know, to wake up somebody in the house. So, the, so we started connecting the dots and go, whoa, wait, well, what if the user whispers to the device? And that is a signal to us that they don't want us to be speaking loud. We know how to whisper, create a whispered voice. Well, let's figure out how do we detect it's a whisper. So we work, started working on it and created models that can detect not only the words that were spoken, but uh, even when whispered, but also that you were actually whispering. Got it. And from there, come up with this idea uh, that, you know, if you whisper to Alexa, Alexa will whisper back. And so I'm going to push two ideas that we've already talked about together. We have speaker ID where we can recognize a person is speaking. And now we have this whisper mode. When you introduce whisper mode, does it make speaker ID harder? I would imagine hearing my voice as a whisper has to be more challenging to detect than it would be as a normal voice, the way that you registered it. Yes, it's, it is harder. <laughs> okay. okay. No, that's a, yeah. that's a very solid answer. Uh, and so uh, does, does, is there anything else uh, about whisper mode that has offered you any interesting challenges or anything that you're like, well, we didn't, we didn't expect that? I think most of them have is again. It's like wake word, right? Uh, you want you want to be very good at detecting whisper. You know, if you start whispering back when you're not whispering, it is it's creepy. <laughs> like what? What is that whispering to me? <laughs> is it trying to confidential information or what? Right. And similarly, if, if you are whispering and it doesn't detect whisper and speaks in a normal volume, it really defeats the whole purpose. You're not you're trying to make sure that somebody in your household didn't wake up because you're just trying to set an alarm right. in the night. So for us, it's really all about how do you find the right balance where it is super accurate. It only detects when you whisper and it doesn't detect whisper when you don't whisper. Uh, and you know, there were uh, first time when we, when we started playing with this thing, we were very worried that if user doesn't know that we have this capability and they just happen to whisper or we miss, <coughs> miss that whisper and it whispered back, it'll create for a really bad experience. So that's why we had this notion when you'll say, I think you whispered, I can whisper back because we're trying to protect against that customer experience where people, were, were, what, what was that about? Right. That's different than what I'm used to. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, all right. So the, the next section is text to speech, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this is the flip side. So if, if we look at the process of, of working through an Alexa encounter and interaction, um, the first thing the user does is says the wake word and we, we, do the, the automated speech recognition and the natural language understanding. All of that goes to some code base someplace to make some decisions about what should be said back to the user. And then at that point, the user provides the text that they want Alexa to say next. Um, and so <clears throat> I, I've noticed um, just in the past year, year and a half, that Alexa's voice has gotten a lot more natural. Um, what are the things that have, like, is something happening in science that has allowed us to sound more natural? Yeah, uh, let me take you back a little bit. I think uh, just to show you how this journey is and then I'll go into what are the different components of TTS that help us produce this very natural sounding uh, voice. When we launched Alexa, the voice was very, very good. People really heard, wow, that's like very human-like. And now you five years later, you see where our voice is. And if you compare back, like, wow, we have come a long way. Even when the, that technology at that time was really, really good. There are multiple components to TTS. Uh, some of them you may not think about uh, as a challenge that TTS has to resolve. The very first one is what we call text normalization. So ST could be a street, ST could be a saint. Yeah. You could also have an ST in the beginning of the name of the street and the street at the end, you know? Uh, so we have to normalize. Uh, we, from based on the text alone, we have to say, is it saint or is it street? Uh, then some, some may have number 20 and the other may have T, W, E, and T, Y. So the very first thing we do is to normalize the text, where we take out some, some of these ambiguities in the task to really figure out what, what is the user trying to say. Once you do that, the next step uh, in, in, uh, uh, in that is, is uh, okay, now I know what words I have to speak but I need to know what is the prosody? Where do I put stress? Where do I put pause? Because when we speak, we have the context. Based on the context, if I'm trying to make a certain point, I'm actually uh, stress certain words, or I'm just going a very smooth, and people stress in a very different ways. 
But you have to un we have to figure out what is the right prosody for what is being said. Uh, does it need a lot more emphasis than not? Where should the pause be? And you have to know the pronunciation of the words, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, um, sometimes we don't get some of those words right, and especially with names, uh, you know, it's not just proper English names. My name is extremely hard uh, for 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 average folks. And uh, I think what TT is trying to figure out how to say this is: is J S Bukan spoken like in Spanish, or is it like J? Uh, uh, so you know, we have to know the pronunciation. We have to know the prosody. Once you know all of that, in the old systems, what used to happen was we will have a model that will predict the prosody, and based on the prosody, it will it will it'll come out with a sequence of sounds that need to be concatenated together. And offline, as part of building the voice, we would have a you know voice talent come in, uh, record a big script. In that script, we're trying to get every possible sound in that language. And the number of sounds in the language are very, very high. Uh, and a lot of that depends on previous word, the next word, you know, many, many different ways. So sure. we would have what we call this database of sounds, uh, what we call diphones. It's basically, you know, previous and the next phoneme because like an apple is different than the apple, you know, the way the apple is spoken. Right. Um, so we had this database of sounds and we'll concatenate those sounds on the fly. And, but we had to find those units that concatenate well together as well. So as part of that selection, as you're figuring out the prosody, you also figure out what is the unit in my database that'll produce that sound and, and really concatenate well. Not every, you know, that, that bit connects well. So that was the old technology. It's very concatenative, and sometimes you'll get some glitches because the closest match we had for a, for a next iPhone um, had a lot of properties we were looking for, but not 100% of the properties we were looking uh, for. So some uh, of them, when you try to concatenate, you will have these ramifications where sometimes you may even get a glitch. Now, bad pronunciation, maybe just we do not know how to pronounce that word. And sometimes, as part of natural sounding, if the process is off, it will not feel natural to you at all, yeah. even if the pronunciation was perfect. So you said something earlier, and I just I need to know what the number is. You said that each language has a number of sounds that can be made. Um, do you happen to know? Maybe you know this off the top of your head. Um, how many sounds are there in like the U.S. English language? I, I I couldn't tell you that number right now. I know it's a huge number. I know how we, with the recording we go through a lot of recording to to get the full collection of sounds, and we always add more too. Do you think it's in the thousands and uh, the millions? No, no, far, far more. Wow. Far, far. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Yeah. I did not realize that. That's uh, that's a scale I was not anticipating. So that's no, no, that's good is. to know. And you want to do it in milliseconds. Yeah. You want to do all of that process super fast. Normalization, pronunciation, process degeneration, finding the units that need to be concatenated, concatenating them on the fly, and not have any of those glitches. So that's <laughs> the that's what used to be. That was the TTS technology we launched with. Since then, there have been numeral numerous innovation on that front as well. And that's why you see the voice finding more and more natural because some of the ramifications that come from concatenating those units, uh, where some of the units that are following each other are not, it's very hard to concatenate them right. Gotcha. Um, all right, so this leads me to uh, some exploration for me. So I, I also dabble with things like Amazon Lex and um, Polly and, and services like that. And I've noticed that some of the voices not only offer what I think is a traditional voice, but also what they call a neural um, model. What can you can you tell me about what that means? And and I mean, I'm guessing maybe that's the advancement that you're describing. That is one of the two. So there are two aspects in what you said. Uh, so let me go through the first okay. one. So the systems were what we call concatenative TTS, uh, where we were concatenating units. Uh, the new technology is neural TTS. You know, it's it's neural network based, and and very similar, it still has a text normalization, it has a pronunciation, then you have a neural model, both sequence to sequence model, uh, that that takes in all of that and figures out what we call spectrogram. It's basically the frequencies and the energy level for the frequency over time, and that's how the sounds are produced. So that will produce a spectrogram that needs to be generated. And then you have a vocoder uh, that will take that spectrogram and generate a continuous stream of audio. So there's no more concatenation going on. Uh, you basically the 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 model the, that is predicting the prosody it is trained on plus it's trained on a you know neutral data so you get a neutral voice uh because that's all it has been trained on 
And then you can add more training data to it, which are very specific to a speaking styles. So the news readers have a specific style of speaking. DJs speak in a very different way. The energy level is different. As you're reading a long book, you will speak differently, uh, depending on the content being rendered. So we, we had this notion that, you know, just having a really good neutral voice is not good enough to have a even more compelling experience. We want to be have different styles because the content we are rendering is different. And based on the content, I want to be able to pick up the style. So then you have, you pick up and have talent record audio for those styles. So you have a neutral model and then you augment the neutral model with the training data for specific styles. And then you can tell the model that, hey, I want to speak these words, but in that style. It can then adjust the spectrogram that it produces. Wow. And wow. And when that adjustment happens, then you have a, the voice that is being produced by the vocoder will match that speaking style. And and you can think on you can think on how many more speaking styles. I mean, we can keep adding right. more and more. The, the wheels styles. are spinning here, just as as you describe it. Like, man, there's so many different ways, uh, and there might even be ones that are, un like, there are ones that you would not normally even want. But uh, imagine the like the teacher from Ferris Bueller's Day Off when he's just standing in the front of the room and he goes, Bueller. Like it's very boring and mon it's it's almost more neutral than than Alexa's voice. Um, I could see times where people would want to use something like that. Um, so yeah, I think there's a wide variety of of things that are normal and that you expect to see, like a DJ or a newscaster. But I think there's probably also a bunch of weird, strange ones too that you could use for specific situations. So we, the 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 process will be very similar. Get the right training data. All right. And 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 based on that, create a style. Okay. And some styles are harder than others for sure because you know um, the the intonations may be pretty much extreme. And but it's all about getting the right data and record. And we have become very good at it. We have created many styles now, uh, and we feel that the 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 process, the recipe we have, is very very good. Good. Okay. So one of the popular we'll call it a style, I think, uh, would be Samuel L. Jackson's voice. Uh, I know that that made a big splash uh, at the end of last year when Samuel L. Jackson was able to um, have some interactions with users and do a lot of the things that Alexa could do. Um, is is that more like where we were in 2014, where we had Samuel L. Jackson read that long script and get all the pieces and concatenate things together, or did we have to did we take it to a neural level where we're actually synthesizing um, and creating those words as we go? In, in both of these, you do need recordings. Okay. Um, because the system has to produce spectrogram that matches your style of speaking. Okay. Uh, and, and the voice characteristics. So you need recordings. Uh, the, the process is different in that you're not pre-creating this units that you kind of concatenate on the fly, but you have to capture the sense of somebody speaking. How they sound and where they put stress. And Samuel Jackson has a very unique style of speaking that everybody knows. Right. So if we speak and if we don't capture that characteristic, people would notice right away. But if I'm unable to capture on a, on, on a voice talent that people do not know, you may not know that it did not capture that 100% well. I would know, but you right. know, we have a trained ear. Well. But with Samuel Jackson, people have watched a lot of shows and he has a very unique style. Yeah. So regardless, you need recordings, but the, the tr this is a training data for the model, which is able to take the relevant information out of those recordings to be able to create a voice that just sounds like him. And and we got a lot of positive feedback on how real that voice sounds, how close it is to Sam Jackson. It's, it's really good. So yeah. uh, so I have two questions to, to tack onto that. Uh, the next is, do we anticipate there being additional, like real celebrity voices in the future? I, I can't tell you which of ones, course, but I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's a reasonable expectation. Okay. And then a question that I get quite often, um, is will there ever be a possibility for me to use whatever mechanisms you're using to synthesize my voice? Uh, I think there's there's a lot in there, uh, but I would say this that uh, we have announced on for Polly, for example, and Polly is based on the same TTS technology that's used in Alexa, what we call brand voice. Oh, okay. Uh, so you can just start connecting the dots. Got now. it, got it, got it, okay. Uh, the brand voice is similar to Sam Jackson, right? We can we can create Sam Jackson's voice. We can create brand voices. It's a very similar concept. Very, very cool. Uh, that, that's just one of those things. It's it's like the um, it's like the speaker ID stuff from earlier. I just, I always wonder 
if we ever even view that as being possible. Because I'm imagining Sam had to come in and record for <coughs> a week or two weeks or whatever to be able to do all the things that we did with his voice. Um, and I don't know that anyone has the time or the commitment or the, the finances to necessarily sit down for a couple of weeks and record every possible sound. So that's a, that's a good bit of information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we're, we're getting close to the end here. We only have about five minutes left. So I, I want to ask one more big question of you. And that is um, you've worked on a lot of aspects of Alexa. Um is there any specific launch or improvement that you personally are the most proud of? Like the thing that you should hold up and say, look at this cool thing I did. I think there are, there are a few of them that go in there. Uh, I would put Whisper in there. Uh, I think there's another thing we did. And some of them are, you may say that technology wise, they're not big advancements, but for value to customer, they're big. And I, I index on those far more than, or oh, technically what we did was super complex. I'm very proud of it. Uh, speaking rate. Um, you know, where we, you can adjust, you can speak slow and you can speak fast. And older people like, uh, you know, for them, speaking slow may be the right thing. Uh, and for people who may be visually impaired, they generally like to um, have things spoken much faster. So the existing technology and small changes, we're able to create a feature that is extremely useful um, to, uh, to, to our customers. So, you know, some of those things give me far more delight. Just, just getting a note from a customer saying, "Hey, I, I tried it. It's so good for me," uh, and you know that just makes our day. So I get more excited about that than because there are a lot more complex technology-wise things we have done. For example, moving to neural TTS was not easy. It requires a lot, a lots of effort and core research and you know scaling and everything else that goes with it. Because these are high compute applications. Right. For me, it's those things. High, co high compute, low latency. That's uh, that's a big. That's a tall order. Yeah. Uh, all right. So th there's one other question I always like to ask everybody that's on this this show, and I, I would imagine your answer will reflect mine. Um, how how many Alexa devices are currently plugged in in your home? Oh, let me see. I got six in my bedroom alone. <laughs> and you may say that I have a, you know, I have a problem I have to think about, but I think that this, they all have such good uh, value proposition. Uh, let me see. I would say I have about fifteen. Fifteen. Uh, including including the two that I have in my car, so Echo Autos. Got it. Yeah, and then Fire TVs with Alexa in it. Sure. Uh, I would say about 15, 16 okay. in my house. And then there's some my daughters have. and you Of know, course. Far more, on my, far more on my account than in my house. So. <laughs> and then uh, on top of that, is there, um, I mean, you have a background in smart home and things like that. Um, is there is there one thing that like you tell your friends or your family about that is like the coolest smart home thing you have running in your house right now? Uh, actually, uh, I have I have integrated Ring into my whole Alexa interactions. Uh, so I have a Ring doorbell, I have a Ring alarm, and when somebody rings my doorbell, my devices say, "Hey, there's somebody in the house." Uh, th there is a uh, somebody's at the front door because that's what I call my my uh, front door bell, and then the video shows up on my Echo Show. I find it so cool right. that as somebody's in the house and I can see the video right there. And the other aspect is it is also integrated with Alexa Guard. So as I leave my house, all I do is I arm ring in an away mode, and it turns on Guard by itself. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's I, a nice integration. Yeah, exactly. I just walk out of my house and I, you know, and I can even speak actually uh, as I'm walking out. And boom, done. Right. Uh, the the one that I, I tell people about, because I think it's pretty cool, is that um, I have the Echo Auto in my car. And as I drive down the street, I tell her to open my garage door. And the yeah. garage door pops open. I think that's a, that's a pretty cool one. But I, the, uh, the ring, I have a ring doorbell as well. And uh, when, it, when somebody rings the doorbell, all the TVs light up with the, the video. It's very, very yeah. cool. Yeah, and you know, having, having a garage door open for you is such a welcome sight. It is. It really is. <laughs> um, you think about that a small thing uh but to me it's great i, I the house is waiting for right me. uh yeah it's 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 just one of those th it's a little bit of joy every time it happens and it's yeah it's just so cool um all right well hey i can't thank you enough for being on here today um i i know i learned a lot and i think our audience there's been a fantastic conversation going on uh, so i think they really had a lot to take away from this as well so i i really can't thank you enough for joining us today 
Well, you're most welcome. I, I had fun. This is a good chat. Good, good. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, as always, we're here Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific. And Manoj, thank you again. Um, take care, everybody. Take care.